me for the support and the guidance and the advice um, that we have received from the Northeastern Nevada Museum. And we are even more excited because they agreed to come and give this historical presentation about a part of Carlin's history that almost everyone in this town knows about. It's almost as if it's a folk tale that's been implanted in everyone's memory. So, we are so excited to have you all here. Everyone always has a story to tell me whenever the topic comes up, which is why we included it in our uh, historical exhibit about the history of Carlin, and why we wanted to make it our first historical presentation, which we are planning on doing many more. But I will stop talking because you know how much I love to talk. <laughs> uh, and I will introduce Diet Mawson, who is the education coordinator at Northeastern Nevada Museum. And this is one of her favorite topics, and so she was very excited when we said, oh, yeah, we So uh, it's going to be very interesting. I am very excited about it. And I will let her go on. Oh, thank you. Uh, so I initially did this as part of a monthly program that I do at the museum. Now it's actually an every other month program, but it was, it's called Brown Bag History. So if you follow the Northeastern Nevada Museum on Facebook, you'll hear about our Brown Bag History um, programs. And we do a different presentation every, every time we do this. And this was one of the first ones that I did. I, was really, I fell in love with it. Um, I learned about this story originally as I was doing a presentation on the Elko Hospital because it, it overlapped with the Elko Hospital quite a bit. A lot of our doctors came over and came to the train station here in Carlin. They went over to out to the canyon and pulled people out of the train. And we're going to talk about that more. But um, I originally did this as the as the anniversary of the incident of the crash approached for my brown bag history and actually August is the month of the anniversary it happened on August 12th 1939 and with that we are going to go ahead and hit the lights I won't feel bad if anybody falls asleep <laughs> um, you know what actually can I borrow your phone I can't see my paper <laughs> San Francisco Streamliner was made for luxury. It was a train that was nearly a quarter mile long, longer than any other streamliner, and painted with bright, colorful images of its namesake. Each car was named for a landmark in the city of San Francisco, California, such as the Golden Gate Park, which was a Pullman sleeper car, the Knob Hill was an observation lounge car, and the Presidio was a dining car. Inside, it was designed with colors and textures that illustrated the latest in interior design. It was the fastest, most powerful train designed and built. It made the trip from Chicago to Oakland in under 40 hours. Um, as I was reading about this train, I kind of, I got the feeling that it was kind of like the Titanic in more ways than one. But <laughs> um, they, they pushed the Titanic out there as the latest and greatest in the way to, ways of travel. It was unsinkable and unstoppable. And in a lot of ways, they described this train the same way. That it was just, it was unstoppable and the best way to travel. Um, there was a 54-seat chair car, a dining car, club car, two compartment and drawing room cars, an 11-bedroom car, one roomette car with 18 enclosed rooms, a duplex car with five double and single bedrooms, and a dormitory car for dining crews, auxiliary power units, and an observation lounge car that had seating for 36 and was equipped with a barber shop, a small bar, a private room for the stewardess nurse, and a facility for emergency medical attention, including an extra berth for a patient if needed. These photos here are all from, um, were taken from the, the pamphlets and advertisement that were produced about the, for the train. 
and was jointly owned by the Southern Pacific, Union Pacific, and Chicago Northwestern Railroad Companies. The city of San Francisco made its maiden voyage on January 2, 1938. Her final voyage ended in a canyon west of Carlin, Nevada, on August 12, 1939. That night, it carried 220 people, 171 passengers, and 49 crew members. Ed Hecox was the, was the relief engineer that boarded when the train stopped in Carlin. He noted that she was 26 minutes late, but that they could still make that up as they crossed Nevada. Later, he said he wasn't sure that he saw what he saw on the tracks near Harney. Whether it was a person or simply a tumbleweed, it didn't matter. When he hit that spot, the train suddenly stopped and the lights went out. He ran down the tracks to the depot at Harney to get help. Within the next 30 minutes, news of the train wreck had spread nationwide. And they, they released an initial, they sent an initial telegram announcing the train crash. And then as soon as the railroad was there, they took over the telegraph station. No telegrams could go in or out. People couldn't even notify their family members. The only source of news in the area was the Elko Daily Free Press. Um, the Free Press office received phone calls that entire night from across the country. All of the major newspapers in New York, Chicago, S San Francisco, um, all across the country. We didn't even have a radio station at the time, actually. KELK was not open until 1954. And so the newspaper, the Elko Daily Free Press, was the only source of news in the area for anything regarding the train crash. Doctors, National Guard, and volunteers came to the site from Car Elko, Carlin, and Biawali. The injured were transported to, the Elko, to Elko General Hospital, and the dead were laid along the tracks and covered. As the engine stopped, I ran... Oh, sorry. How did, in, yeah, sorry. Ed Hecox, the engineer, was quoted in the Northeastern Nevada Historical Society's quarterly saying, as the engine stopped, I ran back. All I could hear was the screams and moans of the injured and dying. Everywhere there was dust. There was no wind, and the dust settled everywhere. I could not see a single living person. I started to run to Harney Station, one and one-half miles away. I must have fallen 20 times on the way. I called all the doctors I could, asking them to bring nurses and bandage supplies. Then I returned to the scene of the accident with the Biawali sex section crew. Flora Collins, who was living in Carlin at the time, was working at the Southern Pacific Clubhouse. And she recalls, it was about 10 minutes to come when the wrecker whistle began blowing, and I immediately ran to the storeroom, my boss right behind me. <coughs> she and porters and clerks, and we put up a large order of loot. By the time we got the order up, the wrecker was waiting to pick it up. We ran across the tracks and found Dr. Charles W. Eastman pacing up and down at the telegraph office. We could hear the supervisor yelling into the phone, telling whoever it was about the accident. After asking Dr. Eastman how we could help, we drove as near to the site as we could and walked in the rest of the way. The first thing we saw were people huddling around a fire. They were, they were the people who were still alive. Oh, thank you. The first thing we noticed was the car changing from smooth, oh, I keep doing this, I'm sorry. <laughs> and in, an, in a story printed in the Elko Daily Free Press titled, Unsung Heroes of the Trainwreck Stor Tell Stories, um, there's a story of some of the survivors that were passengers on the car and their, what their experience was. The first thing we noticed was the car changing from smooth, easy riding to roughness, similar to a plane hitting an air pocket. It gave us a queer feeling and before we realized it, the lights went out. And we felt that the car started turning over, turning down into unknown space. We turned over twice and then the car rested on an angle. We were more dazed than scared. We had no idea what had happened. Knowing electrical construction, I tried to connect the, the emergency lights that I knew were carried for just such purposes. 
Something must have gone wrong, for try as I would, I could not get a connection. In the meantime, our breathing became heavy <coughs> every minute, and a sort of black soot started settling around our mouths. Evidently, air conditioning became disconnected, and the fumes spread. Mm. I yanked one of the door crossbars and broke one of the windows, having tried to do so with a shoe and finding the window of special construction. Fluger stationed himself at the other end of the car to see that everyone got out and did not cause any delay by trying to carry any baggage. The only thing we permitted them to take was ladies' handbags. All passengers in our car moved under their own power, except four who were badly hurt. Mm. <coughs> Thank you. Southern Pacific officials called it an act of sabotage. Railroad detective Dan O'Connell headed an investigative team and had his agents comb the wreckage and area for evidence. He outfitted several posses at the Bell Ranch to ride over hundreds of square miles to look for clues. O'Connell called in divers to ride over to ride over hundreds. Wait, wait, sorry. O'Connell called in divers to search the river bottom. Southern Pacific offered a $5,000 reward, then upped the ante to $10,000. That offer still stands today. Divers found heavy tools in the Humboldt, and other searchers discovered two jackets, which O'Connell claimed were dropped by the murderous culprits. Shady characters, 26 of them, were arrested, questioned, and released. Several men confessed, but all were eventually labeled as deranged or seeking publicity. Thousands of people were questioned in the following months, months which stretched into years. No one was ever charged with the crime. This man actually was described as the man without an ear. Um, because the, the shape of his ear there. And actually, as I was looking through other photographs and through this book, The Tragic Train, um, he shows up in pictures that he's helping people. So, I don't know what he was doing there, but he wasn't a passenger and he didn't work for the railroad at the time. Mm. And he was actually incarcerated and arraigned, held over in Reno um, for several months, and they eventually brought other charges against him for other, other crimes that he had committed. But not this one. This one he did not do. <coughs> Many local people believed the railroad claimed sabotage to avoid paying millions of dollars in lawsuits. There seemed to be no gray areas. It was just black and white. FBI men disagreed with the railroad officials, as did a sheriff and town constable, saying that they could not find any evidence of rail tampering. On the other side, intelligent people, like Mayor David Dada of Elko, said there was no doubt about the accident being caused by a moved rail. While agents and lawmen swarmed over the countryside around Harney, some of the injured were released or transferred from the Elko Hospital. Um, these ones here are some of the just outlandish <laughs> newspaper things that were printed about the reward and all are searching for Tarzan Jr. Because they kept saying that no man was physically capable of um, lifting and moving a rail and with or without ears because they said they were looking for the earless man. <laughs> um, Southern Pacific Company posted this one as well. We'll pay a reward of $5,000. This is one about the jackets. I mean, these jackets look pretty ordinary. They could have been found in any Sears and Roebuck catalog. Um, but this is the point where they raised the reward to $10,000. And then this one is another just ridiculous one. Pull spikes with hands or teeth. Oh. Fix a four inch rail offset so the engine and front cars stay on the track. Because when the train crashed, the, the engine and the front few cars did stay on the track. Um, it was all the back and the middle cars that came off. In fact, the middle cars were the ones that were all destroyed. And then this one is just announcing where people could send information if they had any. This correlates, corresponds with this photograph that we have here. 
Um, let's see. That one, it was number, what did I say? It was number nine. Mm -hmm. Number nine right here was the Presidio dining car. That was where the most damage was. And the majority of the um, fatalities and injured were in that car. I'll pass this around. It doesn't have any numbers, but it does have arrows pointing with the names of which cars. Did they ever investigate the the dining car? Could it have been the kitchen? That no, it it had to do with the rail tracks, the tracks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the way the tracks. Well, worked. because he was having trouble beforehand with the air quality and whatnot. No, that was the survivors after the crash. Oh, okay. So this is the point, the point of the crash. I'm used to a stationary screen, sorry. Um, we've got Elko here and Palisade, Carlin. So then they came around into the canyon here and the crash was right here in this curve, right as the river comes across. In fact, right here, there was a bridge built across the river that the train cars took out as they crashed, they, they wrecked the, the bridge. And then they came up to, the lead car was up to about right here. So then he ran up here to Harney Station in Biawawi. Okay, and if you'll pause for just a moment while we switch our technology around to the modern day. <laughs> I just wanted everybody to see the picture. Okay. Oh, where's the computer? Oops. Here, give me that. When we did this in our theater at the museum, it was a little bit easier because all we did was turn the seats for for the people. Yeah, <laughs> it was really easy. We just have two screens in there, and we just turned the turned the turned the seats around, so everybody just turned to see the rest. Can I keep handing you my papers? Sure. Thank you so much. <laughs> she's a long-time school teacher, so she's, yeah. she's good. <laughs> she understands. <laughs> I wouldn't want to put all that back together. <laughs> I have to do it every time. <laughs> yep, we're ready. Thank you. All right. Again, in our in the Northeastern Nevada Historical Society's quarterly, um, Thomas K. Hood, who was a 1939 Elko High School graduate, he later became a surgeon at Elko General Hospital. Yeah. He said, I had decided to go to a movie that evening with one of my friends, Robert Bruce. As we were going into the theater, we heard the city of San Francisco come down the track. And as usual, we stopped and watched it go by. It never stopped in Elko, it just went through town at 40 miles an hour, bright yellow, and all those people riding in luxury and looking out at us, and we looking in at them, thinking that sometime we might be fortunate enough to ride that train. I'm sure that there weren't five people in Elko who had been on that streamliner. You had to pay an extra fare of $10. Wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's um, another Elko physician, Dr. Les Morin, said, I got a call from Dr. A.J. Hood after a late dinner. I went to the office, didn't know what we were going to find, didn't know what the Sam Hill we had to take, we didn't have very many splints. We had some gauze bandages and loaded up with all the morphine we could find. We went down to Carlin where they had hooked up a caboose to an engine and they took us down to the wreck. And in this picture, this man right here is Dr. Morin. Leo Puccinelli was also an Elko graduate and was spending that summer working for the mortuary. Later, he became an attorney in Elko. Um, he said, in 1939, the ambulance service in Elko was supplied by the mortuary, more often than not using the hearse. I was called around six or seven in the morning. I went over to the mortuary and was told to go with the hearse and to pick up a couple of station wagons, then go to the Western Pacific Depot because there was a relief train coming in. 
We had more than 30 injured people there and had to get them to the hospital immediately. I recall how tenderly I handled the first patient, then the second and third, and finally, they were stacked up and we had to get moving. I got to the point where I couldn't treat them quite as tenderly. By the time we had handled 20 or so, we were just interested in getting them to the hospital as quickly as possible. I'll never forget the reaction of the first patient we put in the hearse. She recognized that it was a hearse and thought it was a one-way ride. Oh. <laughs> Um, a man named Jack Martin worked for Reinhardt Clothing Company at the time. Mm -hmm. and he said, people were coming out of the hospital with no clothing. All their possessions were gone, lost. They had to leave with some type of clothing, so the railroad contracted with Reinhardt Company to provide clothes. I was in charge of the men's department, and Dale Bell ran the ladies' department. We took a large stock of merchandise to the hospital, fitted the patients very nicely, took their names and sent the bill to Southern Pacific. There was no problem with collection. Mm -hmm. These two photographs are a part of our archive collection. And I'm gonna read the captions that are printed on them. And I have to preface that by saying that many people were very suspicious of the railroad. They were, they were suspicious that the railroad was trying to cover things up. And, um, and in a lot of cases, they were, they were taking people's pictures. They were taking their photographs and their film, their cameras, so that they could, um, to, collect those, to collect those things and keep them for evidence. So that is why these sound just a little bit funny. Mm -hmm. Um, these were the captions on these were written at the time that the photos were taken by the person by the photographer And it says For this one here It says this shows a, a view looking west down the track Showing the way the wreck occurred by a turned rail There was just too much speed and the rail turned over turning over the train Do not let this out of your possession as we are all dealing with the railroad and don't want any of these out Either this or number two, everyone says this is the true story of the wreck. Mm -hmm. And then number two is that one down there in the corner. And it says, this shows another view from the same, of the same rail. We have good testimony this rail was removed by 8 a.m. while there were still dead bodies in the train. And note the man in number one covering, by the, covering up the splinters where the right truck ran on the, ran on the ties as the rail was turning. Everyone wants these two, but have not let a one out until we find what the railroad will do. And so see, she says that the man is covering, covering the tracks right there to try and cover things up. The caption on this photo Reads, City of San Francisco wreck. View showing one Pullman headed for the river, one setting at an angle. The Pullman at the right is setting on the rails. The view of the rail, which was moved, were taken under the Pullman at the right as it was stopped over the spot. Mm. So this is the wheel of the one that was sitting kind of up up there, kind of in the front on that one. And you can see how it's just not, it's not all the way on the rail there. These images were taken of the wreck cleanup. Um, I found it really, personally, I found it interesting because to me it's hard to, with all the technology and things that we have today, it's hard to fathom how they would have been able to do this. Keep going. In this one here, there is a story, um, a man named F.S. Foot. Uh, was thrown out of the car that he was riding in. And from the description, things that he described, I'm thinking that he was somewhere in this picture here, in this part of the wreckage. Um, he said that he was thrown from the car and he laid there with the other people that were in that car. There were four of them total. And he laid there, 
talking with all of them, he, I believe that he was the only one who survived. Mm -hmm. He laid there as all of the others, talking mm -hmm. with them as they all passed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, he went through a, at least a year of surgeries and therapy, physical therapy, just to get back on his feet again after the, mm -hmm. after the accident. Next. And go one more. All right, these ones were taken um, two years ago in the week that I originally did this presentation. Um, I actually was able to go out to the site and see where it all happened. It helped me to visualize what was happening there. So this is a photo, of a panorama photo of the crash that we held up to compare with. And we could see, as we compared, we compared the, the mountain here with right here. And then the train, as what we visualized was that the engine was up here somewhere in this little, little canyon space here. But um, after this crash, the railroad actually moved the tracks. They moved the tracks and pulled them away from the mountain and they rerouted the river so that now instead of coming under the track and going this direction, the river goes up next to the mountain between the track and the mountain. So they, they completely rerouted it. Um, this is a better angle that shows where they rerouted the river. Right here is the dirt bed where the bridge was. And so the river originally came through right here and then up. And all of this green right here is where the river wants to be. But now it comes around <coughs> right through here, through the mountain, around close to the mountain. And the tracks, when, during, when this crash happened, the track was right against that mountain right there. This is the, the westbound track and or the eastbound, I'm sorry, it was the eastbound track because the train was westbound. Um, they used this track to pull the, the caboose that Dr. Morin was talking about. That's where they took the relief trains out. They took them out on that track so that they could then take the, the victims from here up to the train over there. And then this one, when we parked, we went in through Biawawi. And when we parked, we parked up here at the top of the mountain. So our truck was way up here. And we hiked down this direction. And as we came hiking down this path, there, there is very much a trail there. And it is a soft, sandy dirt as if hundreds of feet had walked across it. Um, as we were looking at it, we were thinking that it was a lot like this. And the descriptions that um, Tom Hood gave of his experience that night. He said, as he and Robert Bruce found out about the wreck, they came out, out from home, they came home from the movies and then they headed out for the site. He said, somebody said to grab the end of a mattress and get to work. So four of us took a corner each, then carried the injured down one track, across the river, and back up the other side. It was a night of a lot of work and a lot of stumbling around. First thing we knew, it was morning and we were awfully tired. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't just use the trains to get people out of there. They had this road up here was lined with cars and people, um, the looky-loos and, mm -hmm. and people that just came out to help. It was lined with cars. So they were taking as many people as they could up this way as well as putting them on the trains. No, it's not. Next one. Don't don't go too fast. Okay. <laughs> extra, extra. The Elko Daily Free Press printed the first, and to my knowledge, the only extra edition of the paper on August 13, 1939. Its front page contained no less than five stories or articles on the city of San Francisco streamliner that crashed the previous night west of Carla, Nevada, near a place called Harney. Also found on that front page was a partial list of the dead and injured. The numbers that morning were at 20 dead and 32 injured. 
There are many suspects arrested and questioned. All were eventually released. On this day, the death toll stood at 22. Each day as they announced something different that they were doing with the investigation, they also announced, announced the injured and dead. Mm. Finally, on August 15th, all bodies and persons on the train were accounted for. The final death toll now stands at 23. Ogden police were searching for an insane man that was connected with two other train crashes. Mm. The paper announced on August 16th that all visitors and spectators were barred from the crash site. The only ones allowed were railroad officials and FBI. On August 17th, death claimed another victim. The number went up to 24, and there it stayed. Elko Mayor David Dada was invited to attend the wreck inquiry, which was closed to the press and public as per railroad regulation. A.D. McDonald, president of the Southern Pacific Railroad Company, issued his first comment to the press thus far on August 19th. His first words were of deepest sympathy to the families of those killed and injured in the crash. The crash remained front page news until August 22nd, when events in Europe began to take precedence. On August 24th, a small article mentioned that Ed Hecox would take the controls of a new streamliner passing through Elko. Mm. In her interview with Howard Hickson for the Quarterly, Flora Collins summed it all up when she said, for weeks after the wreck, every time the disaster was mentioned, we cried. 40 years later, recalling the night of August 12, 1939, still brought tears to her eyes. And that is the end. The real end. <laughs> <laughs>